Your Excellencies, Friends, we have concluded the SDG moment. Please welcome the host of the Transforming Education Summit, Folly Ba Tibot. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the official opening ceremony of the Transforming Education Summit Leaders Day. My name is Foli Batibo, and it's a great pleasure to be your master of ceremonies this morning. One year ago, in his report on our common agenda, the UN Secretary General announced his intention to convene a Transforming Education Summit. He did so in response to what he called a global crisis in education, one of access, quality, and relevance. Now, over the past year, people across over 150 countries have been working to generate new ideas and renewed urgency to end this crisis and to reimagine our education systems to be fit for the 21st century. Over the weekend, thousands of people descended onto the United Nations to mobilize for change. And today, world leaders have gathered to put forward their commitments to ensure that education is accessible to every single person in the world and empowers them to help shape a more peaceful, just, and sustainable future. So thank you for being here and welcome to you all. Now, the global crisis in education affects us all, of course, but right now, it is affecting one group more than any other, children and young people. So, to begin today's proceedings, here is a snapshot of their concerns, their ideas, and their demands. Take a look. I'm from India. I am from Nigeria. I'm from Turkey. I'm from the United States. I'm from Puerto Rico. I want world leaders attending Transforming Education Summit to revive and rejuvenate the education system in their country. You're not doing enough. You should do more. I am disappointed that more than 260 million children are out of school all over the world. Inequality is one of the foremost challenges to reaching education everywhere. Children are not given enough food at school. Climate education is still not a topic well addressed in curriculums. Refugees are still suffering from the low quality learning or no learning at all. We need to rethink and reformulate new approaches to teaching, learning and evaluating. I urge world governments to invest more in professional skills training. I want digital education, emotional intelligence and 21st century skills to be part of our curriculum. Educators need to be trained in strategies that will ensure students with disabilities are included within the classroom. The educational system needs to place more emphasis on early intervention. A proper education, the needed safety within the school, as well as preservation of their mental health is a must. To me, education is the foundation for self-determined life, especially for young girls and women all over the world. Dear world leaders, if there is something or a favor we would ask for, we the people from the countries where education means all, please, please implement the policies you're trying to make during this summit. Education empowers us to dream. It empowers us to realize those dreams. It gives us the will and power to grow together because when we grow together, nothing is impossible. Education is our fundamental right. Education is my right. A educação é um direito fundamental para todos. Please let me learn. 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 A simple but powerful message that you heard there. Let 
them learn. Let them learn. Now, we have a very busy program ahead of us today that will include a number of leaders' roundtables and thematic sessions throughout the day focusing on cross-cultural priorities, cross-cutting, rather, priorities for transforming education. We now turn to a number of high-level dignitaries who will share with us their perspectives on why and how we must transform education. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to introduce first the person who has brought us all together here today to mark this a true turning point for education. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Excellencies, dear young people, teachers, parents, and partners. Throughout my life, education has been my guide and touchstone. I regard myself as a lifelong student, and I've done great inspiration from my work as a teacher many decades ago. Without education, where would I be? What and where? would any of us be. Every single person in this room knows education transforms lives, economies, and societies. But we also know we must transform education because education is in a deep crisis. Instead of being the great enabler, education is fast becoming a great divider. Some 70% of 10-year-olds in poor countries are unable to read the basic text. Either they are out of school or in school but barely learning. Even in developed countries, education systems often entrench rather than reduce inequality, reproducing it across generations. The rich have access to the best resources, schools and universities, leading to the best jobs, while the poor, especially girls, face huge obstacles to getting the qualifications that could change their lives. Displaced people and students with disabilities face the highest obstacles of all. The COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on learning worldwide and dealt a hammer blow to progress on SDG4. But the education crisis began long before and runs much deeper. The report card from the International Commission on the Future of Education put it clearly. Education systems don't make the grade. They are failing students and societies and favoring growth learning and competition for grades. Too often, curricula are outdated and narrow. Education systems take little account of lifelong learning and teachers are undertrained, undervalued, and underpaid. The digital divide penalizes poor students, and the education financing gap yawns wider than never. We will not end this crisis by simply doing more of the same, faster, or better. Now is the time to transform education systems. So, dear world leaders, your people, the world's young people and future generations are calling on you to act with vision and purpose. A new vision for education in the 21st century is taking shape. Above all, quality education must support the development of individual learners throughout his or her life. And it must help people learn how to learn with a focus on problem solving and collaboration. It must provide the foundations for learning from reading, writing, and mathematics to scientific, digital, social, and emotional skills. It must also develop students' capacity to adapt to the rapidly changing world of work. And it must be accessible to all from the earliest stages and throughout their lives. 
and it must help us learn to live and work together and to understand ourselves and our responsibilities to each other and to our planet. At a time of rampant misinformation, climate denial, and attacks on human rights, we need education systems that distinguish fact from conspiracy, instill respect for science, and celebrate humanity in all its diversity. Excellencies, excellencies, to move from this vision to reality, allow me to highlight five areas for our attention and commitment. First, we must protect the right to quality education for everyone, especially girls, everywhere. School must be open to all without discrimination. We must recover the years of education lost around the world because of the pandemic. Quality education for all means tackling the crisis in foundational learning and ensuring it is lifelong, and placing a greater focus on education in crisis hotspots. From this platform, I appeal to the authorities in Afghanistan, lift all restrictions on girls' access to secondary education immediately. Girls' education is among the most important steps to deliver peace, security, and sustainable development everywhere. Second, teachers are the lifeblood of education systems. We need a new focus on their roles and skill sets. Today's teachers need to be facilitators in the classroom, promoting learning rather than merely transmitting answers. We also need to tackle the global shortage of teachers and look at increasing their quality by raising their status and ensuring they have decent working conditions and continuous training and learning opportunities and receive the adequate salaries. Third, school must become safe, healthy space with no place for violence, stigma or intimidation. Education systems should promote the physical and mental health of all students, including their sexual and reproductive health. Excellent. Excellences. Fourth, the digital revolution must be a benefit to all school children. I ask states to ensure that students and teaching establishments be better connected. In this regard, our GIGA initiative aims at putting all schools online. But connectivity in itself will not be enough to provide an education. I encourage governments and teachers to work with partners in the private sector to develop digital educational content of a high quality for everyone. Fifth, the question of financing. None of this will be possible without an increase in funding for education and without a surge in global solidarity against inequality. In these difficult times, I call upon all countries to protect the budgets for education and to ensure that their expenditure in this area is translated into a progressive increase in resources per student and by better academic results. Educational funding must be the number one priority of governments. It is the best investment that a country can make in its population and in its future. And the international community has a crucial role to play. I would ask our development partners to cancel the reductions in aid and to devote at least 15% of public development aid to education. The international financial institutions must provide resources to developing countries and allow them budgetary flexibility so that they are able to invest. Their disbursements and their advice must correspond to the goal of ensuring quality education for everyone, girls and boys. I also invite the international financial institutions to benefit from the International Finance Facility for Education. This tool aims to mobilize $10 billion to help around 700 million children living in lower middle income countries to receive a quality education. Dear friends, the Transforming Education Summit can only achieve its global goals by creating a global movement. Governments, 
young people, civil society, teachers, corporate leaders and donors are becoming mobilized. The United Nations is pooling all its strengths thanks to the action of UNESCO, UNICEF and United Nations teams present on the ground. Let us move forward together so that everyone can learn, can blossom and dream throughout their lives. Let us ensure that the students of today and future generations will be able to access the education that they need in order to create a more sustainable and more inclusive, just and peaceful world for everyone, for girls and boys. I thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Thank you, Secretary General, for your powerful message. Another round of applause, please, for the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. It is now my pleasure to invite the President of the UN's Economic and Social Council and the permanent representative of Bulgaria to the United Nations, Her Excellency, Ms. Lachezera Stoeva, to give her remarks. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address the Transformation, uh, Transforming Education Summit. I commend the Secretary General for proposing this summit in his groundbreaking report entitled Our Common Agenda and for convening us here today. Education is in crisis globally, yet another crisis, one might think, and they could not be more wrong. The fact that two-thirds of the 10-year-olds around the world cannot read and understand a simple story should not only alarm us, it should terrify us and propel us to take action. The crisis in education we are facing is one of equity, inclusion and quality. Millions of children, and especially girls and young women, could be shut out of a key path towards a brighter future. This is not only unjust, it is also an enormous loss of human potential, innovation, and creativity. Excellencies, transforming education and thereby unleashing human potential is key to all progress, and it needs to happen now. If we are to fulfill the vision of Agenda 2030, we must realize that SDG 4 on ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all is actually not a goal. It is the means to achieving the rest of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Success in delivering SDG 4 will unlock progress in achieving other goals, including reducing inequalities, spurring climate action, and empowering people towards the job and the future. Education go, goes beyond skill acquisition. It is a foundation for peaceful societies and effective institutions. We must keep the focus on the most vulnerable who risk to be left behind. The model should be shifted. To paraphrase Mr. Gordon Brown, instead of developing just some of the potential of some of the young people, education should develop all of the potential of all of the young people. Excellencies, at the 2022 ECOSOC High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development last July, more than 140 ministers and multiple stakeholders reviewed the situations and the SDGs with a special focus on SDG 4. Let me highlight a few key policy messages from the ministerial declaration of the HOPF addressed to this summit. First, the right to education is a human right. It promotes the realization of other human rights and the achievement of sustainable development. Second, investing in inclusive and equitable quality education requires sustainable funding. Third, governments are encouraged to invest in resilient, inclusive, and shock-responsive public education and to increase or maintain the share of public expenditure on education. Fourth, Additional measures are urgently needed to mitigate the effects of school closures and cuts in national education budgets, including on learning, child nutrition, and all forms of violence. Fifth, we must hold firm on our commitment to ensure free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education for all girls and boys. 
sixth, governments are encouraged to adopt education and lifelong learning strategies, policies, and budgets that ensure gender equality um, in and through education. Seventh, the teaching profession has a key role to improve quality of education and learning at all levels of education. Eighth, it is critical to promote digital technologies, including access to broadband internet and techno technology devices, connectivity, digital inclusion and literacy, and incorporate digital competences into the educational system. And finally, the declaration calls upon member states in collaboration with other key education stakeholders, in particular youth and civil society, to work towards the transformation of education systems to achieve SDG 4 and better prepare our societies for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, today we encounter a new education landscape. This transforming education summit is just the beginning. It is up to all of us to ensure that commitments are translated into actions and policies to fulfill the vision of Agenda 2030 and SDG 4. Without quality education for all, there is no future, or at least there is no bright one. So let us let them learn. Thank you. them learn let them learn that's our message for today thank you so much madam president for your contributions now in the lead up to today's important gathering a pre-summit on how to transform education was held in june earlier this year at unesco headquarters in paris to tell us more about unesco's work in reimagining education please welcome its director general madame audrey azoulay bienvenue à la directrice générale de l'UNESCO. Welcome to the Director General of UNESCO, Madam Audrey Azoulay. Monsieur le Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, Uh, dear representatives of youth, students, educational communities, dear friends. It is a particularly symbolic moment to find ourselves here at the United Nations, despite the disasters happening in the world, here as we are to defend the universal right to education. I'm proud to see amongst us many representatives of the educational community and we need to hear their voice, we need their experience and I'm also so happy to see so many young people here being given such prominence at this summit. Thanks to your participation, all your participation, this global common good which is education is finally being accorded the position which it deserves. Namely, it is being placed at the top of the international agenda, and I would like to thank the Secretary General of the United Nations. We should recognize the extraordinary power of education, but power which is nevertheless often underappreciated and underfinanced. Education, which whenever we have placed our faith in it, in teachers, in schools, has changed the lives of individuals, of nations, and of entire generations. There can be no economic development and no peace without education. And it is at the heart of the mandate of UNESCO for 75 years since our first major literacy campaigns in the south of Italy and in South Korea, our organization has relentlessly accompanied its member states to ensure that this fundamental right is effective and genuine. Whereas 400 million children were deprived of schools at the, at the in the year 2000, 20 years later, that figure has decreased by 40%. There is progress, therefore, but it's still, it is still not enough because a 40% reduction still means 244 million children that will not be going to school this year. And, of course, here I would like to uh, take up the appeal just now issued by the Secretary General, and that is of the United Nations and, and our call for Afghan girls all of them, of all ages, be able to 
uh, go back to school. It is their right. But another aspect of this educational crisis is the fact that a lot of children that are in school, even though there are more of them, are not learning properly. And this situation has been uh, worsened since the educational disaster uh, that was the COVID-19 pandemic. The figures that we published last uh, July, together with UNICEF and the World Bank, show that Although 57% of children uh, of 10 years cannot, did, could not understand a simple written text before the pandemic, that figure has now gone up to 70%, and in sub-Saharan Africa, it's 89%. It is urgent, therefore, that collectively we reverse this trend. With regard to its content, education cannot either be rigid or inadequate for the needs of the 21st century. What is at stake in this transformation of education is fundamentally linked to the content of learning. Education, if it is to be relevant, must be adapted to our world, to our century, in order to train the citizens of today, but, overall, uh, but above all, the citizens of tomorrow. This has been UNESCO's guiding thought since 2018. Uh, we took this up in 2018 together with you all, and we've uh, put this into our report on the future of education. Drawn up under the leadership of Madam Sali Work Zudi, the President of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, and I thank her for this work. This is the document, as you know, which is a reference document for this summit, the future of education. Uh, it calls upon us to place education at the heart of our plans for society, at the heart of the social contract that we are to forge. To, it calls upon us to overcome the risk of stagnation by placing education at the heart of this new social contract adapted to the great challenges of our time. And I'd like to quote here three of them. Our uh, report as a living reality on the planet, the digital transformation, and finally peace. Three central topics for an education in our times and also for tomorrow. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the first of these themes, our relationship with nature and the need to find new responses to address climate disruption. For this, education has a key role to play. Yet, less than half of all countries truly address environmental issues in their school curricula. Our commitment at UNESCO is to support our member states so that all are able to give climate education a central place by 2025. This means for us accompanying our member states through this transition, because it's also a transition in education, by offering concrete assistance to transform school curricula, to train teachers, to make educational institutions models for the rest of society to follow. Second, the challenge of the digital uh, era. Because right now, this major technological and anthropological turning point is neither regulated nor controlled. But the digital world is not an obvious world. It's not that intuitive. We must therefore make it truly accessible to all ages through open educational resources so digital gaps do not widen inequalities between generations and between countries. We must also teach users to master this digital world and to approach it with a critical mind, which is what we've been missing in the recent years. UNESCO is committed to this through the development of digital skills and media and information literacy. Third and lastly, and this is the essence of UNESCO's mandate, education must always foster peace. It must support understanding and respect of diversity, respect of others in diverse and intercon interconnected societies. To this end, our member states in Paris have made an essential decision. They have decided to reshape international doctrine on this subject. And we've started 
a global conversation to reform UNESCO's recommendation on education for peace and human rights, to guide public policies in response to contemporary challenges, and to do so for the long term. Excellencies, in this interconnected world, education also requires international cooperation, and this is why we are here discussing education at the heart of the UN. Since last year, we have collectively reinforced the institutional framework that guides international cooperation on education, the High-Level Steering Committee on SDG4, under the auspices in UNESCO in, of, uh, of UNESCO in Paris. This committee will make it possible to better coordinate the efforts of education actions, in particular to monitor commitments, including the commitments made at this summit. Commitments that have been prepared through national consultation, supported by UNESCO in over 150 countries. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the president of Sierra Leone as co-chair of this committee for his unwavering dedication to this cause. And of course, of course, we will also need more adequate funding, more material, more financial and human resources. Last November, UNESCO convened the Global Education Meeting where our member states adopted the Paris Declaration. In doing so, they committed to setting aside at least 15% of public spending or 4% of GDP for education, compared to 3.6 uh, points uh, today in low-income countries. This engagement is indispensable, as you know, as we know that education is not a cost, but the best investment. There is no fairer and more effective investment than education, than investing in teachers, in schools, than training and recruiting teachers, to train them better, to consider them better. And this is also what we all realized during the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to transform education itself if we want to transform the world. The message that was brought here ahead of this summit by the young generation is very clear. We need to transform education so that they can have the future they want. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General, to remind us that we have to act urgently to change course. Of UNESCO mentioned late last year, the International Commission on the Futures of Education released a report urging us to reimagine education to equip, equip learners with all they need to thrive in today's world. Well, to find out more about the recommendations of the report, let's now hear from the President of Ethiopia and Chair of the International Commission on the Futures of Education, Her Excellency Ms. Sally Wogzwede who is sharing her remarks via video message. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs les chefs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Madam President of ECOSOC, Madam uh, Director General of UNESCO, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Secretary General, I wish to thank you for having, ex having extended an invitation for me to take the floor during this important summit in my capacity as uh, the Chair of the International Commission on the Future of Education. This is a clear message of recognition of the work done by the eminent members of the Commission. For this, I thank you. Three years ago, when the Initiative on the Future of Education was launched, I declared that we can no longer tolerate uh, the future of the planet uh, being uh, uh, dictated by the, uh, those who are fewest in number and the ch their pressing challenges of our era. They require mobilization of uh, knowledge, culture, and collective experience. The future should be shaped in a democratic way at the global and local levels with respect for human rights. Education is a collective responsibility, a, a collective project for the future. Let us never forget this. We can transform 
perform education only together as a woman from the African continent uh, where the population is the youngest I profoundly believe that knowledge and education can literally shape the future in a single generation yes I said in one generation this should be our ambition our current educational approaches educational models cannot meet these aspirations it is our duty to transform education both to correct past exclusions and to shape a more sustainable future for this reason we need to uh, release the transformative uh, 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 potential of education this is the thrust of our report to uh, rethinking future together a new social contract for education a new social contract for education it's a strong transformation on our way of thinking and acting in education. First, we need to think of education as a common good and a global responsibility. We can only fight COVID pandemic if everyone is protected. We can only fight the pandemic of inequalities if everyone is educated. We have a deep obligation to fully involve the whole society in decisions about the futures of education and above all the youth it is through education that we reach across generations. Education is everyone's responsibility, not just school systems. That is why we need a new social contract. Second, we need to protect schools as unique and irreplaceable institutions. But at the same time, we must transform them, change their form. We need more open and diverse educational environments, new educational ecosystems that favor cooperation, curricula based on the knowledge commons, and a more collaborative teaching profession. Changing the form of the school implies changing pedagogy, the work of students and teachers, the relationships with knowledge and learning, with cities and societies. Let us be clear, we are facing the greatest transformation in the history of education. Third, we need to radically change the decision-making process in education. Nothing will be transformed from top to bottom. We need to change our approach. We need to value the work, initiatives, and the experiences of teachers and schools and communities that around the world are shaping the futures of education. We need a strong, collaborative, socially valued teaching profession that is well-educated and properly supported. The great work ahead of us implies this change of method, this change of perspective, so that different and more sustainable futures of education can flourish. For these transformations, we need the engagement of universities, a greater emphasis on innovation and research, as well as a global international cooperation based on the principle of solidarity and mutual learning. We need to stress education as a public and common good. We need to value inclusion and diversity we need a new way of living with the planet, a new humanism, which is more than human. We need to understand that education is always a relation between humans for the elevation of our common humanity. I am acutely aware of the many challenges that we all face, but there is no more pressing concern that the, that the transformation of education at this particular juncture. If we are to rise to our responsibility with history, we must lead in, in creating a new social contract for education, one that duly allows us to reimagine the future together. I hope that our report will continue to serve for this collective ambition. That is why the report is mainly an invitation to dialogue and action. We need to make education help us all to be better prepared for the future rather than to be a tool for reacting to what the future brings. I thank you very much. Our thanks to the President of Ethiopia for setting out why we need a new social contract for education. And now let's hear from the leader responsible for mobilizing action to make that social contract a reality. Please welcome the President of Sierra Leone and co-chair of the High-Level Steering Committee of Sustainable Development Goal 4, His Excellency Julius Maadabio.
Mr. Secretary General, President of ECOSOC, Director General of UNESCO, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, youth advocates. This summit demonstrates our shared and very timely commitment to urgently address what has been aptly referred to as the learning crisis. In Sierra Leone, where I come from, we have been aggressively transforming our education sector since 2018. We have done so in order to address questions around inclusion, quality, retention, completion, and transition to technical, vocational, and higher education. Improving educational outcomes in a country where there have been very little investment in education and falling standards was clearly a challenge. School infrastructure, curriculum, policies, and governance had to be urgently addressed. Girls, pregnant girls, poorer learners, learners in rural areas, learners with disabilities had unequal access to education that was on offer. Learners had uneven access to foundational learning, food, teaching, and learning materials, wash facilities, trained teachers, and more. More importantly, we did not have enough money to undertake the necessary reforms we had envisioned. But because of strong political will and a commitment of our people, four years on, we have increased enrollment across board by more than one million additional learners. We have achieved gender parity in enrollment. We have revamped our curricula at all levels to include critical thinking, comprehension, computational thinking, creativity, and civil and civic education. Girls studying STEM subjects can now be educated from primary through university, tuition free. Pregnant girls can once again go to school, and we are supporting learners with disabilities, with specialized teaching and learning materials. More students are sitting and passing exams than ever before in our country's history. These are but a sample of the achievements we are proud to share as a nation. But then the big question is, how did Sierra Leone do it in the COVID period? We focused on goals, investment, and inclusive and innovative strategies. First, we are clear that our goal was to make education our main vehicle for national development. By making basic and senior sec uh, secondary education free, we sent a message to every Sri Lankan that they too deserve to be included. Education. After all, education is not a luxury. It is a right. <laughs> Second, we raised our domestic investment. We raised education's share of the domestic budget to 20%. Schools, school fees and exam fees are now a thing of the past in our government-supported schools. We have expanded school feeding and hired thousands of new teachers and increased their salaries even 
during COVID-19. Third, we innovated in our policies and technology tools, always with a view to improve inclusion and access. We adopted a radical inclusion policy to deliberately support those most at risk of not reaping the benefits of an education. We hosted 14 countries that signed the Freetown Manifesto to make a commitment to gender transformative leadership in and through education. But we are only getting started because I personally believe that SDG 4 is essential to achieving all other SDGs. We stand ready to work with partners to continue to develop this vision and improve education outcomes in Sierra Leone. As part of the summit preparatory process, we mobilized all actors in support of national consultations on the, transforming, on, on the transformation that we want and in advancing the summit's action tracks. The SDG High Level Steering Committee, which I coach here, and the Summit Advisory Committee have been paramount in this regard. Personally, I met with various stakeholders, including school children, in preparation for this summit. This is why today I'm pleased to announce a new level of ambition to make education an even stronger driver of gender equity, inclusion, and sustainable national development. Today, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone commits to cut in, ha in half the number of out-of-school children of primary school age by 2030 compared to today. <clears throat> we will launch an alliance for educational learning through which we further commit to cutting the rate of learning poverty in half or more by 2030. We commit to preparing our students for the future by making climate education a central component at all levels. Today, Sierra Leone also commits to setting measurable targets for skills training and technical education. We must support all young people to become nation builders. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, through SDG4 High Level Steering Committee and other global, regional, and national mechanisms, we must monitor progress towards the commitments made at this summit. We must rally the international community behind the global initiatives being launched later today during the, sport, the spotlight sessions. And we must ensure the youths are central to the entire process. Let us join forces, assume leadership, and collectively pave the way for a brighter future for our youth. 2030 is not far away. Let's get going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your remarks. And as the President said, let us join forces. Thank you to all of our speakers for their inspiring words. Please join me in a round of applause, another round of applause for our opening speakers. Thank you, thank you so much. Earlier, we caught a glimpse of what young people think about education and what they're calling on world leaders to transform exactly. Over the next 15 minutes, we'll delve deeper into that with contributions from an incredible group of young people. Shortly, we'll learn about the demands of young people as captured in the youth declaration that has been developed by young people across the world as part of the summit preparation. 
But first, it's my great pleasure to welcome four brave, three brave first powerful women to put a spotlight on one of the most unjust aspects of our world today, the exclusion of women and girls from education. Please give a warm welcome to Vanessa Nakate, climate justice activist and UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. Liza Pozivnich is a student at uh, St. George Academy here in New York who recently fled the war in Ukraine. And Samaya Farouki is an activist and former captain of the Afghan all-girls robotics teams. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I know a young girl, her first task every morning is to gather water so that her mom can begin to prepare food for the family. With climate change, this girl is forced to walk farther and farther to find the water. Soon it will be impossible for her to complete the long journey and still make it to school. As the climate crisis worsens, young girls are facing increasing workloads looking after their families. They are also facing increased domestic violence and child marriages. All of this is severely limiting the ability of girls to access and complete their education. And as the climate crisis worsens, these horrifying cycles spiral. Around the world, more than 240 million children are shut out of school. And according to UNICEF, 400 million children live in areas at high risk of cyclones, and 820 million children are highly exposed to heat waves. More than 186 million children go to primary schools without any electricity. This not only leaves them without access to basic lighting and digital learning, it also leaves them exposed to climate dangers such as heat waves with no ability to power vital systems such as air conditioning units. While all children need support in order to access education, the climate crisis disproportionately affects girls. Closing the gender gap in education can help countries better adapt to the climate crisis and decrease the threat and the impacts of climate change. One study found that the death toll due to weather events could be 60% lower by 2050 if 70% of women achieved lower secondary education. Project Drawdown estimates that investing in education and family planning could reduce emissions by over 85 gigatons by 2050. That's about a decade's worth of China's emissions. Today, you are all here to help find solutions that will transform our education systems and make them fit for purpose. Climate action helps girls stay in school, which in turn helps countries tackle the climate crisis. We must make it possible for all children to have access to an education, and we must help them be able to stay in school. Their futures depend upon it. And it turns out, so do all ours as well. Thank you so much. My name is Elizaveta Pasivnich. I am a student from Ukraine. I grew up in Lvov with my older sister and parents. My favorite subject is geography. In my school in Ukraine, 
I had a favorite teacher of the subject. Thanks, uh, she is a very professional and positive teacher, and it is indeed thanks to this teacher that I fell in love with this subject. I think that education is a very important aspect in the life of every person because without education, it will be very difficult for a person to find themselves, to realize their purpose in life. And the more edu educated people there will be, in the, there are fewer wars and problems there will be in our world. Arriving in another country with a different language and a completely different mentality is very difficult. Usually, refugees who flee their country because of war are in a disadvantageous financial situation. This makes learning virtually impossible. All of my friends and relatives are still in Ukraine. They are still there. They are frightened and shocked. However, Despite the fact that war is raging in their country, they intend to pursue their studies with the hope of a better future. None of them wishes to leave their native home, their country, and I too wish to return home because there it will be far better for me to continue my studies. My message to you as leaders is that you must make education free for all students who leave their country, regardless of the circumstances of the world. Young people are the future. Without education, we will be unable to fully realize our great potential for the benefit of the entire world. Thank you. My name is Sumaya Faruqi, and I'm an Afghani student. A year ago, I was sitting in a classroom and optimistic about the future. I was a senior, excited to finish the final year of my secondary school. As the captain of Afghan Girls Robotics team, also known as the Afghan Dreamers, I spent my days working on robots, learning, and dreaming. While I wasn't in school, I was traveling around the world with my teammates to compete in international robotics competition. In a country where girls make up over 60% of out-of-school students, my teammates and I had beaten many odds. We were inspiring other Afghan girls and boys and making our country proud. But that all changed on September 18, 2021 when Taliban closed the girls' school in Afghanistan. While our cousins and our brothers sat in classrooms, me and millions of Afghan girls were forced to put our dreams on hold. Today, girls' secondary schools remain closed. Without education, my cousins, my friends, and millions of Afghan girls fear an uncertain future and feel abandoned. The Taliban is slowly erasing our existence in the society. Thousands of girls may never return back to school. Many have already been married off. The promises of reopening their schools came and gone. Today, Afghanistan is the only country in the world that forbids girls from attending to schools. This week, you are all here to propose solutions to transform education to all. But you must not forget those who left behind, those who are not lucky enough to be at school at all. Show your solidarity with me and millions of Afghan girls. You must work together to demand the reopening of the girls' schools and also protection of our rights.
fun to our education system in Afghanistan. Critical resources are needed as we should, we should be make sure that all children access to education, even as crisis continues. If you think that Afghan girls deserve the right of the education, so do not let me and my sisters in Afghanistan to become the victim of the global politics. Do not let our country to become the symmetry of our goals and dreams. Thank you. Such brave young girls, such powerful words. We must not erase girls' existence into society. We have to let them learn. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Elisavata and Somaya. Thank you for your powerful message. A round of applause once again, please, for these brave young ladies who are speaking truth to power today. And now it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage Nobel Peace Prize Laureate and UN Messenger of Peace, Malala Yousafzai. Seven years ago, I stood on this platform, hoping that the voice of a teenage girl who took a bullet in standing up for her education would be heard. On that day, countries, corporates, civil society, all of us committed to work together to see every child in school by 2030. Yet halfway to that target date, we are facing an education emergency. Let's remind you once again what's happening. In Afghanistan, Taliban have banned girls like Sumaya from their education. In Uganda and Pakistan, droughts and floods are ravaging homes like the ones where Vanessa and I grew up. And conflict and violence in countries like Ethiopia, Ukraine, and other countries are keeping girls like Yelizaveta out of the classroom. If you are serious about creating a safe and sustainable future for the children, then be serious about education. You have heard enough about how education transforms lives, strengthens economies, and contributes to a more peaceful world. You know every country, community, and corporation would benefit from every girl having access to safe quality and free education. And if you are still in doubt about the impact of education, go ask a girl. She will tell you what education means to her. Most of you know what exactly needs to be done. You must not make, you must not make small, stingy, and short-term pledges, but commit to uphold but commit to uphold the right to complete education and close the funding gap once and for all. You must use the power you have to take action. Allocate 20% of your budgets to education. High-income countries, increase aid, cancel debts, and set fair global tax system so that low-income countries can spend more on girls. Remove gender bias from curricula. Improve content 
and make schools safe for girls. And work together with those who are the closest to the challenges to transform education. Today, you have heard from Vanessa, Sumaya, and Yelizavata. They join millions of young people from around the world who have written demands in the Youth Declaration. And they stand ready to lead the way. Soon, you will hear from young leaders, Olesis and Karimot, on behalf of youth around the world. I hope in another seven years, we will speak to you again. But instead of urging you to help us, we will be cheering and celebrating the progress you have made for girls. When you leave this room today, please ask yourselves, how many more generations are you willing to sacrifice? How long will you make girls wait for what you have promised? How many more times do we have to stand on this stage to be heard? Buenos días, líderes mundiales. Good morning, world leaders. Good morning, world leaders. My name is Karimot Odebode from Ibadan, Nigeria. And with me here is Ulises Drenji from Argentina. The world is going through multiple crises. And we, the youth of the world, are suffering the most from the impact of decisions that we did not make. We have had enough. Our holy source of hope and resolution is to transform education. Education is our future, and the future is now. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that will not come again. And so we are taking matters into our own hands. The time is now for you to listen to young people. We are no longer accepting your silence. We are no longer leaving the tune to play itself. Over the last few months, we mobilized our peers at the global, regional, national, and grassroots levels to share our stories, our voices, our pains, and our needs for a better education. The commitment and passion to this was a clear sign of the importance of this very moment. From alien and Lebanon, despite blackouts in the middle of the night, she led discussions to Jean Marie, who lives in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, and gathered the voices of over 80 young people who share their vision. The Youth Declaration is the collective vision of half a million young people from over 170 countries across all regions. This is the start of a global movement. This declaration will guide each one of you into the successful and meaningful engagement of young people as a founding document that will remind you whether you are failing us or not. So far, you owe us. We are speaking on behalf of all of them to call on you, world leaders, to honor the responsibility you have been given. We demand that our voices be heard. Our life experiences heard. Our demands addressed. Our efforts, leadership, and agency acknowledged. From now on, we are equal partners at the decision-making table. We demand an intersectional approach based on principles of human rights, sustainable development, gender equality, climate justice, inclusion, diversity, but most of all, solidarity. We demand you take responsibility and act now. 
We know that there is money and resources available. We know what needs to be done, and we know how to do it. So, what have you not? We will not stop until everyone in every village, highland, city, has access to quality education, which is a fundamental human right. What part of history do you want to belong to? The ones condemning our education? Or the ones who transform education? We, we the, the youth, youth of, of the, the world, world, raise our, our hands, hands for SDG 4. Committing to holding you accountable because we have no other choice. It is our lives and our future. Will you join us and act? What a powerful declaration. Thank you to each of our incredible youth contributors. Their voices matter the most. Please, another round of applause for our youth contributors. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go off scripts for just a moment and tell you about a scene I just witnessed backstage. It is that of a young Afghan girl who, after delivering her speech to you here at the General Assembly, was in tears backstage. Because while she's here physically, her heart and her mind are back in Afghanistan, thinking about her sisters, her cousins, her girlfriends, who are not in school today. Just put that image in your heads. A young Afghan girl at the United Nations in tears because she feels powerless today. It is up to you, all you leaders here today, to make sure that we do not abandon these young Afghan girls. Please, they must go to school. Let them learn. Now, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from the world's young people and a number of distinguished leaders let us now turn to the second part of this Leaders' Day opening. We'll shortly begin a discussion with UN leaders and two amazing voices from civil society and the teaching profession about how this transformation of education can be advanced in concrete terms in countries, in communities, and most important of all, in classrooms. The purpose of this panel will be to move to a substantive and political discussion around bringing that transformation to all learners, no matter what the local context. Our distinguished panelists will notably be touching upon the critical role the international community and the United Nations development system must play in supporting this translation of words into concrete action. And our exchanges will be further enriched by the perspective of two critical stakeholder representatives in this transformation, persons with disabilities and teachers. So please join me now in welcoming to the stage here, right here, Ms. Catherine Russell, Executive Director of UNICEF and Chair of the UN Task Team on the Transforming Education Summit, Mr. Hulin Zhao, Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Unit, Ms. Winnie Bianima, Executive Director of UNAIDS, Mr. Filippo Grandi, High Commissioner of UNHCR. Mr. Jose Vieira, Advocacy Director at the International Disability Alliance. And Mr. Mugwena Maluleke, Secretary General of the South African Democratic Teachers Union and Vice President for Africa of the Executive Board of Education International. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here and for stepping in uh, for this very important conversation, no doubt. Thank you. Ms. Catherine Russell, let me start with you, Executive Director of UNICEF. Now, as you walk into the UN Plaza, the UNICEF installation <coughs> highlights that only one in three 10-year-olds globally can read and understand a simple story, which is quite shocking, isn't it? So after governments set out their commitments today, what must the UN family, the UN system as a whole, do to ensure that transformation translates into clear improvements for the world's most vulnerable learners? 
Well, first, I think what you said is exactly right, that it, it should be shocking. I hope everyone in this room is shocked by that number because it's really devastating to understand the impact of that on children. And I think the young people, having their voices here is so important because you hear their impatience, right? They want us to solve these problems. Uh, it's absolutely clear that children, especially the most marginalized children, that's girls, that's children with disabilities, children living in humanitarian crises, are facing a true crisis in education. And you know, we say crisis so much around here that sometimes you lose track of it, but this is a crisis. Uh, I'm glad we're here, we're discussing this issue, uh, and we're highlighting the changes that have to be made. But I have to say that this, this is an urgent problem, and it's not going to happen. Solving this problem is not going to happen without a, a commitment from country leaders like we heard from the president of Sierra Leone. It's going to take concrete steps to ensure that all children are being educated. Um, we, at UNICEF and, and other parts of the United, United Nations, will help. We are here to help. Uh, we will work to ensure that all children learn the basics, that they can read, that they can do their numbers, they can continue to learn. And we will support their mental health and their digital inclusion, which are absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. We need to support teachers, principals, parents, and we need to monitor and, pro monitor and measure our progress to ensure that there's successes and failures, and we know what they are and we can learn from them. Adequate funding is absolutely key to this, and we all have a role to play in helping governments fund education, including ways to alleviate the debts of poor countries, which are really devastating and are making it very difficult. Um, we're all here today because we're educated, as the SG said. Mm. Our children, no doubt, are well educated. Who doesn't deserve that same opportunity? So today is an important step, but it really is a first step, and we have to see it that way. Looking back on this day, we will have failed miserably if we don't ensure that education is a reality for all children. Thank you very much, Ms. Russell. Thank you. You touched upon the challenges there, of course. Let me bring you into the conversation, uh, Mr. Hulin Zhao, Secretary General of the ITU. Uh, speaking of the need to reach all children, last year, two in three children and youth had no access to the internet, of course, when, when the world went virtual. So drawing on those lessons learned during the pandemic, what actions do you think, Mr. Zhao, need to be taken today to ensure that digital connectivity is a game changer in this global effort to transform education? Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me just uh, thank the summit to bring ITU to the stage. I come to this hall many years, but never come to this stage. So I'm very pleased <laughs> to join this panel. <laughs> You know, IT created uh, 1865. We put uh, our technologies uh, of communications uh, as our main task. But however, we also pay attention to support the education system. You know, that in the last century, with our newest technology like broadcasting satellite, uh, we provide uh, tele-education to provide courses through television, broadcasting, and uh, by uh, satellite. And over the long period, we noted that uh, this now needs to be further upgraded. So that uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, of this century, we uh, launched our initiative to connect the schools, because to provide courses may not be enough. And you mentioned these uh, figures, and we heard a lot of shocking uh, statistics. We know that uh, this uh, is somehow very important for our uh, planet for a world that uh, you know we have to give uh, our children and give our schools very good uh, opportunities of uh, equal education with good uh, quality of education so that uh, we ITU you know try to uh, set up uh, some kind of uh, uh, level for example you know through our wishes process we try to encourage our world to have all schools be connected by 2015, but unfortunately we are still looking at this issue. And we also work very closely with many UN agencies to promote this, like even, you know, I, I talked with you to, to see how can ICT assist refugees, and you kindly support our proposal. And also, you know, we worked with UNICEF, uh, UNESCO mm -hmm. to have e-education, and we worked with uh, ILO for providing training for Africa youth to increase their digital skills. Or, and of, of course, recently we worked with uh, UNICEF 
to launch the GIGA project to connect the schools. So all this, uh, I think that is quite necessary, but still, I see the big gap. And the pandemic helped us a little bit uh, in such sense that we have more people connected, more children connected, more schools connected, but we still see the big gap there. And with this uh, pandemic, we see the power of uh, ICT, not only for uh, telecommunication, but for almost uh, everything, for all the ecosystem. And we also see the good power uh, to support uh, our education system. And I made uh, my proposal at the last uh, uh, test advisory committee uh, that uh, maybe ITU could work with the UNESCO and the education system to provide uh, some kind of uh, standard uh, making mm -hmm. uh, process to help our schools to share their, uh, their data, to share their practice, to share their uh, you know, curricula. And uh, we also encourage our members to training teachers and to encourage SMEs to provide good app and to provide local contents to help our society to understand the situation today. So that is what we are doing, but still, I'm afraid that we still have a lot of things to, to do. And right. the lesson we learned from the previous call to connect everybody uh, you know, quickly and uh, not leave anybody behind. And that is uh, our uh, call from Secretary General of the United Nations, you know, Guterres. Uh, he announced that uh, at this uh, place, uh, 2020, and we see still a lot of challenges here, so that uh, we need to work together. So, and uh, ICT will try to do their best to support all the mm, ecosystem and right. to, uh, so, uh, so, to reach the goals. Okay. So, so the, there's urgency, as you say, to transform both the content and delivery of education, yes, of course, yes. but also to walk, work across all sectors, as you yeah. said. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, let's let's uh, go a bit deeper into that issue of working across all sectors with you, Ms. Winnie Pianima, Executive Director of UNAIDS. You know, the necessity to break down the silos and connect the dots between education, health, and gender. Uh, how can we work together across constituencies and sectors to, to harness the power of education to transform systems? while also advancing issues like gender equality, of course. Thank you, Foley. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be on the panel with my colleagues from the United Nations. Uh, Catherine talked about crisis and that we say the word so often and we all, almost, it becomes normalized. It shouldn't. And I'm going to put here another crisis that we have to pay attention to and that's the crisis of HIV AIDS and the havoc, it's, the devastating impact it's having on adolescent girls and young women, particularly in Africa, but also all over the world. Let me put some shocking data here for you. Our data, UNAIDS data for 2021, showed that in Sub-Saharan Africa, 4,000 girls were getting newly infected every, you might think every year, or even every month. No, every week, 4,000 of our girls are getting newly infected every week. And if that's not shocking enough, six out of seven of new infections, HIV infections, amongst teenagers between the age of 15 and 19, six out of seven are girls. That's how disproportionate the impact is, the risk is of HIV. This is a crisis because when a girl is infected at that early age, there's no cure for HIV. That marks the rest of their lives, their opportunities. But here's the good news. The good news is that we know again from our research that if a girl completes secondary education, never mind if the quality isn't even there yet, as it should be there. Never mind if it's just being in the four walls of a classroom up to the end of secondary school. 
that risk of infection reduces by 50%, 50%. Now, if in that school space, you also tackle certain issues to make the school space even more safe. For example, you introduce there what is called comprehensive sexuality education. I know the word is contentious because of tradition and religion and culture, but call it what you want. But if you give a girl life skills to know about her body, how she will look after it, how it will transform and she knows how to be safe, you reduce the risk further. If you take out of the school space sexual harassment, and that's by addressing toxic masculinities, this idea that for a boy to be a boy, a man to be a man, they must be aggressive, they must force themselves on a girl or a woman. If we take that out, if we tackle it and show that there's peaceful masculinity for boys and bring that in the school space too. We reduce the risk even further. Mm. So, who can do this? We realize that we need to work across sectors and that's why our joint partnership was formed. That's why the UN brought 11 agencies together to fight HIV AIDS. Because HIV AIDS isn't just a disease. A pandemic is more than health as you can see. It's education, it is health, it is human rights. So we've come together, UNICEF, UN Women, UNFPA, UNESCO, and us UNAIDS who bring the partnership together of the UN on HIV AIDS. And we are working together with governments, with girls' movements on the ground, with corporates to push for universal secondary education, get the girls in the classrooms, and start to work on the policies that will reduce their risks. Mm. And here's the last piece of good news. 12 countries in Africa have stood up and embraced this initiative we call Education Plus. The 12 countries, from the president to the first lady to ministers of education, of health, and of gender equality, they are coming together to champion the right for a girl to be in a classroom and in a safe classroom. Mm. This is what we are doing. It's and in a partnership across sectors. A great, a great example really of how all UN entities and, and bodies are working together to push forward the, this uh, initiative. And just a reminder, an important reminder there, given the, ex the examples you gave us, that education is not just a fundamental human right, but also a key enabler for achieving progress of the sustainable development goals, of course. Absolutely, and if I might, might add, this initiative doesn't only reduce the risk of HIV, mm. it reduces the risk of teenage pregnancies, of early marriage, and of violence against okay. women and girls. So many outcomes through one initiative. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Winnie Bianima, for, for giving us that example talking about the experience of, uh, of UNAIDS dealing with this issue. Let me bring you into the conversation, Mr. Filippo Grandi, High Commissioner for uh, UN Refugees, uh, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, we heard a powerful message, and I'm not sure you were able to hear it, Mr. Grandi, from Liza, from Ukraine. And I wanted to ask you what education transformation means for refugees and people who are displaced by conflict, by climate change. What does it mean for them? What does it look like for them? Thank you, and thanks for having me. It's always so difficult to speak after Winnie, but anyway, <laughs> I'll do my best, and, uh, because she said it all, in a way. And, but let me maybe take it from a little bit more personal perspective. I've worked with, in crisis situations with refugees for more than 30 years. And one thread that I have observed is that for people impacted by crisis, including refugees, displaced people, education is an enormous priority. It is more a priority for them sometimes than the program meant to help them. And we need to reverse that. Um, you know, I've, I've worked for many years with Afghan people, with Palestinians, the populations that have been affected by crisis for so long. 
education is a priority. I have seen parents of young refugees making incredible sacrifices with the little resources that they have to allow their children to go to school. Why is that? I think that is important for everybody. Education, we've heard it this morning in so many ways, is important for everybody. But for people who've lost it all, whether because their homes have been destroyed or because they had to flee, education is crucial. Mm. Education is identity. Education is opportunity. Education is hope, a much underrated uh, frame of mind that we should support all the time. And for people who hopefully will then get out of crisis, education is an investment in their future so that they can play a role in reconstructing their countries, their communities, or if they're refugees that get resettled, they can contribute to other communities hosting them. There's 100 million people today that are refugees and displaced. Half of them are children. And they are part, these children, of the hundreds of millions of children in crisis that we've heard so much today. And as we heard, we have made a lot of progress in enrollment of children in crisis, of quality of education, but I am very worried. If you look at the themes that this General Assembly will deal with, uh, climate, war, um, uh, hunger, all of these are factors of crisis that risk making us backtrack from the gains that we have made. I'm just back from the Middle East where I visited Syrian refugees in so many places due to the lack of resources Syrian girls are getting married very early, and that means dropping out of school. So the gains that we've made in the past few years, we risk losing them. And finally, just to say two things. What do we need to do? I think that the key word here is inclusion. You know, in the old days, in crisis, we tended to construct education or other programs ad hoc for people that are in crisis. Now I think the focus, as the Compacts on Refugees says very clearly, the, the focus is including them in national system. Inclusion doesn't mean integration forever. It means inclusion during the period during which they need the protection of another state. And this applies to displaced, but it applies also to girls, to people with disability, all those people that are particularly impacted by crisis, and this, this means two things essentially, good policies of inclusion, of inclusive education by governments, and resources, resources, resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Grandi. Thank you. And just to pick up on inclusion, you talked about inclusion. I want to, to bring in Mr. Jose Vieira now, the advocacy director at uh, International Disability Alliance. Mr. Vieira, what are your reflections on what we just heard, and how do we collectively ensure that inclusion, inclusive access to education, becomes a norm and no longer an exception? Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, I grew up in a city where my blind fellows dreamed of learning music to become part of a blind national choir or learn carpentry to make some money. That's all what they dreamed about, but not because that's all what they wanted to do, but because of what the system offered them as opportunities. Special schools and segregated education system, that's all what they were able to provide. This morning, we heard the Excellency Secretary General in his introductory remarks, the question of without education, where we would all be? And the answer that I have to give you all on learners with disabilities, the answer is outside school. The 240 million learners that even before pandemic had less opportunities than others attending school are outside the system, and therefore, they will not have 
more dreams than my fellows blind in Argentina a couple of decades ago. Colleagues, I'm more helpful and hopeful if I leave this room later today hearing many more of you talking about persons with disabilities and learners with disabilities. So far, I have heard very little today. But we do have an opportunity. And panelists here have said, education means entity, identity, investment, opportunity. But let me add one more thing. It has to be for all. Inclusive education is not only good for learners with disabilities, but it's good for all. Finally, we come to this meeting, to this summit, with the hope of seeing education being transformed. But we also want to make our contribution. And our contribution is a call to action for everyone. Colleagues, we need more national budgets allocated to learners with disabilities. Without budget, SDG 4 will not be achieved. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, we need learners with disabilities being able to access education systems. Assuming that at least 10% of learners are learners with disabilities in any country, we need to plan accordingly. Last but not least, this call to action that is a result of a civil society effort by the International Disability Alliance, the International Development and Disability Consortium, and the Global Campaign on Education, call upon all of you to do more if we want to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Señores y señoras. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no time left. The time to wait has expired. Thank you. Powerful remarks. Thank you so much. Education has to be for all, mm -hmm. and we need to emphasize that. We keep talking about equality, but very often we do forget about, not forget, but we tend to put aside uh, the idea of, of you know, education also reaching people who have disabilities. So thank you so much. Ed education, as you said, is not a privilege, but a global public good and a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. And each and, and every learner across the globe has the right to it. Thank you once again, Mr. Vieira. And let me come to you now, Mr. Mogena Maruleke, who's the uh, Secretary General of the South African Democratic Teachers Union. Uh, we saw, Mr. Maruleke, the, the dramatic educational disruption that the pandemic brought, and as well as the broad national consultations carried up in the lead up to this summit, we saw the critical role that teachers play. I know all parents during the pandemic realize how critical this role of teachers are because we couldn't do it very often teaching our own children. So where do teachers fit in all of this, this transformation of, for education that we're calling for today? And how do we support teachers to become agents of transforming education? Thank you so much. And uh, excellencies, uh, colleagues, um, Thank you for the honor and the privilege for us to be here. I think allow me to be a little bit personal so that we can understand how the teachers fit into everything that has been said here. I have been a teacher for 34 years. But today I am not speaking for myself. I'm speaking on behalf of the 32 million teachers that are represented by Education International through our 383 member organizations around the world. I was born on a farm in the apartheid South Africa. There was no school on the farm. So I was not allowed to go to school until I was nine years old. And when I was allowed to go to school, I had to cross the river by swimming during rainy season to go and access education. I worked as a child laborer. I worked in the morning. I worked after school until 7 o'clock in the evening. So where is the agency of the teachers in all this? So education has expanded my world, but not only because of 
the education and the knowledge I received, but importantly, in the human interaction with my teachers. I was determined and turbocharged by my internal moral engine to be part of that world. Yet since teachers did, didn't generally look like me, I knew that becoming one could mean a world of difference for the students who do. From my work as a teacher, my understanding of the power of collaborative professionalism and organizing grew. Individuals can become heroes, of course, but a movement can transform the course of history. And that's where the teachers come in in all what we have had today. We are to build a movement to transform education that will be responsible if we are individuals who cannot achieve that. It is only possible if we become partners in real sense of the word and focus very clearly on what it takes to achieve SDG 4. And it's very simple. Free quality education for every student. The needs are very simple to restate. The first is we need 69 million teachers to join the teaching profession. But not only to join, we need to bring them in, we need to keep them in the teaching fraternity, in the profession. But to do that, I have learned as a child, as a young man who joined the teaching fraternity, that we need to create transformative environment. We need decent salaries for the teachers. We need to trust the teachers and allow them to exercise that professional autonomy in what they are doing. That's where the agency of the teachers are, because they build the nation, they build all the profession, and they build characters, and they build relationships. So therefore, we need to be able to support them. The second, us that we are here as excellencies to say, please, wherever you are, remember the teachers. Remember and trust the teachers. Trust them so that they can be able to exercise their pedagogy, the knowledge that they have to be able to interact with our children and be able to challenge them to become critical human beings. And the third one that we need is to make sure that this profession is heavily funded. Because if we are not going to fund infrastructure, if we are not going to allow each and every student to have the necessary resources for them to be able to learn, we have seen how the pandemic has exposed those inequalities, and we are here, excellencies, to say, remember the children, remember the teachers. Let's make sure that when we leave this assembly, we are able to see action. And action is only if we can support the teachers, making sure that there is funding for education, making sure that no child is left behind. And that is what we are here for. We are here to build a movement, and that is our charge. Thank you so much. And that much. is our partnership. Thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you. A round of applause, please, for Mr. Malumeke. Speaking on behalf of all teachers in the world, we appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists for such a great discussion, which truly highlighted the essential dimension of the transformation of education that is related to support and investing in teachers, as we heard. Thank you all very much. Once again, our panelists, a round of applause, please, for Catherine Russell, Executive Director of UNICEF, Mr. Hulin Zhao, Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Unit, Mr. Winnie Bianima, Mr. Filippo Grandi, Mr. Jose Vieira, and Mr. Mugwena Maluleke. Thank you once again. A round of applause, please, for our panelists. Thank you for a very insightful conversation. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, what a wealth of ideas and opportunities for genuine change. Our panel discussion highlighted once more that transforming education is a very complex task that calls for collective mobilization now, today, not 
in 10 years, not in five years, today. Thank you all once again for joining us for this session, a session which started us off in the right direction for transforming education together. In just a little while, don't go yet, we have a very big surprise for you, by the way. Can I just say, huge surprise coming. So a reminder that we have an exciting program ahead of us today. In just a little while, there'll be three parallel sessions taking place uh, in three different rooms in this building, uh, including the Leaders' Roundtable and Spotlight sessions on initiatives such as girls' education, financing, and digital connectivity. So I really welcome you to go and, and check out all those three sessions that are happening throughout the afternoon. And then join us again later here in the General Assembly Hall for the closing ceremony with the Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohammed. But before we go, as I said, we have a big surprise. Before we go, we have one final treat for all of you. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'd like to welcome to the stage an international music sensation, a Grammy award-winning singer and songwriter, and a UNICEF Goodwill ambassador. Please welcome to the stage, Angelique Kidjo. Woo! Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing? You doing okay? I'm really happy and honored to be here with you today, especially today, because education is my passion. And uh, with UNICEF, I've seen firsthand the benefits of education on the communities, on the families, and the countries. So for me, I don't have to be convinced. You perhaps need convincing. And if you need convincing in 2022, there is something wrong about what we have been doing for so long. So if we don't invest in the, in the girls' education, in the children's education, we have no power. There's no power without education. And here is the place of power. We have leaders here, and your leadership has to be investing in education and in health. How can anyone tell me here, I love my child, I love my children, yet you don't invest in their education? What kind of people are you? What kind of parents are you? So this song that we, I'm about to sing is to thank parents, people, leaders that believe in education and invest in education. So. As you know me already, you're going to have to sing. There's no pass. There's no way you can walk in here with me here without you singing it. Okay? So I'm going to teach you this song. Kelele, kelele, and you answer, oh, kelele, baba, wa. Kelele, kelele, oh, kelele, baba, wa. Okay, let's start again. You're looking at me like, what's up? So, I'll go. Kelele, kelele, and you go, oh, kelele, baba. Kelele, kelele, oh, kelele, baba. Let me hear it. Kelele, kelele. Kelele, kelele. You know it, but be in rhythm. When we start, it's going to be faster than that. You ready? Uh, you ready? All right, Dominique, let's do it. Ah, 
바보로 미모자렐라 같이 쉬지 오줌미 바보로 미모자렐라 같이 쉬지 오줌미 이원이 어머라 어머바바 이원이 어머라 어머바바 이원이 어머라 어머바바 라라리 몰라 시쇼 케레레이 케레레 오 케레레 바바와 컴온요 케레레이 케레레 오 케레레 바바와 케레레이 케레레 오 케레레 바바와 케레레이 케레레 오 케레레 바바와 바 바제니 로궁 오두레레 바바제레 바바오 아하바 바 바제니 로궁 오두레레 아예 바바 고줄레 아하바 바 바제니 로궁 오두레레 바바제레 바바오 아하바 바 바제니 로궁 오두레레 아예 바바 고줄레 연마소 Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for our session this morning. I wish you some fruitful discussions this afternoon. Thank you so much once again for joining us. And remember what the Secretary General said. Let's move forward together today. Thank you. I'm Fuli Bhatti Bo. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>